All right, good, technically good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I'd like you to welcome you to the noon hour webinar for October. We're gonna be learning about the spotted lanternfly, which is the next big ugly bug that we're hopefully gonna avoid in New York, but in reality, it'll probably show up. And we're, uh, we're joined today by a speaker, Tim Weagle. Tim's with uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. I attended a conference down in Binghamton, New York in mid-August and Tim was there and I put him on the spot and he agreed to give a presentation. <laughs> so I'm, uh, um, I'm pleased to have uh, Tim share his, his uh, experiences and knowledge about this bug. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim and I'm gonna mute and just sit back and enjoy. So Tim, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your taking the time to do this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Um, I am the grape and hops IPM specialist with the New York State IPM program, and um, they love hops. They are actually, or excuse me, they love grapes, and they like hops, but they're actually killing vineyards down in southeast PA where they first got started. So I have a particular interest in this pest, but um, today we're going to cover spotted lanternfly. He asked me to talk about the understanding the ecology and the threat and so if we go today's agenda, basically we're going to talk a little bit about or cover why do we care about spotted lanternfly. Then we're gonna go into its biology and identification, pathways and spread, monitoring and management for this pest, and then we'll have some time for questions, hopefully. So why do we care? This is actually the first insect pest that New York State has been concerned enough about to come up with an incident command system. And you can see the organizations there on the right-hand side, the Department of Ag and Markets, Department of Environmental Conservation, Parks, USDA, USDA APHIS, even New York State Department of Transportation, Cornell Cooperative Extension, the PRISMS, and then the IPM program are working together. And the reason that they put together an incident command system is so that there would be one concerted effort. We wouldn't keep reinventing the wheel. So this is actually a great thing. I think that um, I do want to say I'm not an expert in spotted lanternfly. A lot of the information that I'm providing today comes from a lot of different sources, um, primarily from Penn State research and extension folks and USDA. And also um, when we get into the regulatory parts of this, um, from the Department of Ag and Markets, Ethan Angel um, provided me with some information. So we're gonna go from that. This pest has everyone in the Northeast and even out into California and the West Coast worried. And so there has been very free flowing sharing of information on this pest. So what is spotted lanternfly? It's actually an invasive plant hopper, the name, um, Lanternfly is a little misnomer, but it's a plant hopper. It's native to China and Vietnam. It, right now they figure that it feeds on over 70 plant species in the United States, and it actually feeds on more than that because they have found that it has some preferred hosts that it likes to feed on, and it will actually feed on other things on the way to its preferred host. So it's just picking up just enough nutrients to get itself to the next one. It loves sugar, okay? So if you have um, plants that have high sugar content in their sap, you will typically see that spotted lanternfly like to feed on that. Tree of Heaven or Alanthus altissima is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. They're trying to figure out if Tree of Heaven is needed for it to complete its life cycle. They've been doing some, USDA has been doing some work on that. Um, as I mentioned, they love sugar, they love the sap. They're actually phloem feeders, so they're not feeding on the leaves, they're not feeding on fruits. Um, they're actually drilling down into the um, trunk and branches and twigs to get into the phloem and pull out that sugary sap. And one of the concerns is they're swarm feeders. We don't know how they communicate, but once they find a good spot, it seems like they will congregate at, on that plant. And they actually return to that same plant year after year, especially if it's a perennial, like a grapevine or a tree. So what are the plants at risk that we're concerned about in New York and the Northeast? Um, grapes, like I said, it's huge. It's, um, they're actually killing 
vineyards down in Southeast PA. Apples, not so much. They do some feeding, but they seem to move on after a week or so, and they haven't seen where the trees have been affected that much. And hops, even though it is a concern over in their native region, uh, doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as the grapes or the apples. They do like to feed on ornamentals. Residential shade trees, you'll see that in the fall. They'll move from um, forested areas and the vineyards, and they'll move into the residential shade trees and feed on those. There was come some concern for the maple industry, especially the um, those that make maple syrup, so the sugar maples. And what they found is there is a preference for feeding in maples. They do like maples, but they like silver maples first. Then they'll feed on red maples and sugar maples. Now, if silver maple and red maple aren't available, then they will pre preferentially feed on sugar maple. And then there's the lumber industry and also the uh, Christmas tree industry. So just some of the trees that are attacked by spotted lanternfly that they've seen down in Southeast PA. Um, as I mentioned, Tree of Heaven is a big one. You have maple, American beech, and birch, um, oak, plums, grapes, willow, hickory, linden, sassafras, black walnut, cherries. You can see the list goes on. So it's a pretty broad range of trees that are attacked. So, you know, what? Again, why are we concerned? Well, if you think about New York State, 63% of it's forested. And you can see 8.8 .8 billion is added to the state gross product. The number of New Yorkers that are employed. So, and if you remember the last slide, what some of the trees that were preferentially fed on by spotted lanternfly, the maple beech birch group, which is over 50% of the forests in New York State, um, are preferred by spotted lanternfly. And red, Maple and sugar maple are the most numerous trees five inches and larger in diameter. So the New York wine and grape industry, as mentioned, we're really concerned in the grape industry. And if you look at the grape growing regions and compare those to the forested regions, you can see that even if they don't get into the forest right away, if they get into the vineyards and start um, increasing their populations, it won't take long for them to move out into the um, forest. And also the nursery crops, Christmas tree and floriculture industries, you can see that they also provide um, a great deal of input to the um, sales in New York State. And the big one is the tourism industry. One of the things they've found is that, you know, it's hard enough to get people to go for walks in the woods. And when you have spotted lanternfly in the woods uh, making the mess, it is really difficult to get the folks to go into the woods. So in New York State alone, it's almost one point or 109 billion in economic impact. The forest for recreational use, as we mentioned, and if you think of Alanthus or the Tree of Heaven, 43% of the tree canopy in Brooklyn, New York is made up of Tree of Heaven. So Alanthus is important. How do we recognize it? The spotted lanternfly, as I mentioned, will feed over 70 different plant species, but it really prefers tree of heaven. And tree of heaven is really everywhere. Tree of heaven has these, um, this is a single leaf down here, and it has leaflets. This has over 30 leaflets on it, and you can see it's um, on a yardstick, so they're rather long. Um, you can tell that one of the distinguishing characteristics are the little knobs here, and the leaves are smooth. They are not serrated. If you look at the middle picture there of the trunk of the tree, it looks like a cantaloupe rind for the majority of its life. These are fast growing trees. Um, they reach large heights. They were actually planted as shade trees um, in Philadelphia early on. Um, so it's an invasive species as well. And you can see that the female, there's a male and female tree and they spread by Samara. The seeds go everywhere. So, so just some keys to correct identification of Alanthus. Look at the leaf margins first. And I didn't even think about Tree of Heaven until I started working with Spotted Lanternfly. And then I started to look. And Alanthus will really grow in the same types of areas as the Staghorn Sumac. So if you get some disturbed soils along riverbeds, railroads, things like that, 
um, they will start growing. I started looking around in my backyard and um, I have Alanthus growing. And it wasn't hard to walk a block and a half over and find a very large female tree of heaven that had plenty of seed that it was spreading throughout the neighborhood. So I think if you go out and you look, you'll probably be able to find tree of heaven. Now I'm in Western New York over by Lake Erie between Buffalo and Erie PA, and we do not have the populations of Tree of Heaven that they do down in Southeast PA where it's almost everywhere. It's hard not to find it, um, but we can find it. So Alanthus, as I mentioned, the leaf margins are smooth. There's no serrations. Um, native species such as staghorn sumac, black walnut, and hickory, um, they do have the serrated leaves or they have teeth along the edges. The leaf scar, Alanthus has a really large leaf scar. It almost looks like a monkey face. And it has a foul odor. This is probably the one characteristic that you can always use, is that if you crush the foliage or you break the twigs, you're gonna get a definite odor. Some people have likened it to rancid peanut butter. Some say the bottom of a Cheerios box when you're done with it. Um, cat urine has been used as a descriptor. And um, so you break it, you smell it. If you get that odor, you good chance it's going to be tree of heaven. If you break the others, like the black walnut, staghorn, sumac, hickory, you get a vegetative smell rather than that foul odor. So the distribution of tree of heaven, you can see that it um, is across the United States. It was introduced to Philadelphia in 1784 and California in the 1890s. Um, it grows in the similar soils and areas as sumacs, and so you really have to look to make sure that it is um, tree heaven and not sumac. And research is being conducted right now to determine if the noxious chemicals from tree heaven, and that's what gives it that rancid smell, um, if they're transferred to the spotted lanternfly during feeding. Um, as you'll see here shortly, there's red coloring in the fourth instar nymph and red underwings of the spotted lantern um, adult. And that indicates that they don't taste good and that they have um, few predators. And there's even been reports from Pennsylvania that chickens will not eat them. So let's go on to biology and identification. The good news is, is there's one generation per year that we've seen in the areas in the Pennsylvania area and south that currently have infestations. So it starts with eggs, October through June, you get a hatch. Um, you'll have the first instars May through June. They basically just become second instars. They shed their skin, um, just a larger version of themselves. Then they go to the third instar. Again, they're black with white spots. And then the fourth instar, you can see where they're feeding more on the tree of heaven. When I was down in Southeast PA earlier this year, I found the um, second and third instar feeding primarily in the grape vineyards. Very few of them were over into the Alanthus yet. But then when I got to the fourth instars, they were more difficult to find in the vineyard, but they were covering the tree of heaven. So the fourth instar will be feeding from July through September. You can see we start to get adults from July and then they go through and we say December, but they're gonna go through until the first hard frost and then they kill off. So egg laying, um, September through December or November, um, earlier than that, if you're a little further north, and then it overwinters as an egg mass. So the first to third end star, you can see they start out about an eighth inch long um, and then become three quarters inch long when they get to the third end star and they're black with white spots. Some people have said when they're that first end star, they resemble ticks, you just have to look um, close and notice that they have the white spots. The fourth end star, bright red with white spots and black bodies. Um, and again, they prefer the tree of heaven. They're really strong jumpers and will often jump away when approached or if they're prodded or you try and capture them. And they're, you know, they're beautiful insects and they're rather large. Um, they're three quarters of an inch long. And here's the uh, female, uh, actually a mated female. You can see that the abdomen is swollen. Um, it's full of eggs. And um, this is the image that they started out with. It's a very striking image um, that 
for identification of spotted lanternfly. But the thing is, you're rarely going to see a spotted lanternfly with its wings out like that unless it's startled, um, it's in flight, or if it has been feeding on a tree that's had a systemic insecticide, then um, it tends to paralyze and flare its wings and you'll see the red underwing. This is more common, the uh, photo on the left there, it's more common what you're going to see with the adults. You can see that it has almost a pearlescent type wing with black spots. Um, very pretty. Again, it's about an inch long, so it's a large insect. And here is what I was talking about. The adult had been feeding in the tree that was treated with systemic insecticide, and it paralyzed, and it's showing that red underwing there. So the spotted fly or spotted lanternfly then lays its eggs and it will lay eggs singly in rows and rows about one inches long. They lay 30 to 60 eggs per egg mass and then they will cover that egg mass with a putty-like substance. Um, when they first put it on there, it's white as you can see in the left-hand photo. Um, it starts, if you can see here, um, down below the second one, there's some single eggs or the egg rows that didn't get covered. It will go to pink and then tan and then on the right hand side you can see that it starts to crack. It almost resembles a splotch of mud so it's very difficult um, to spot. I mentioned in their phloem feeders so they basically take their um, proboscis or the mouth part and they drill through the twig. This is a head-on view. These little orange spots up there are actually their antenna. And they'll drill through there. They're sucking out the um, phloem. They're actually not looking for the sugar in the sap. They're looking for um, amino acids and nitrates. And so they're pulling all this sugary sap out, which they don't really want the sugar for. So they're expelling that out. Um, and let's see if I can get the... Okay, so you can see they're not feeding on the fruit. They're actually feeding on, this is grapes, and you can see the honeydew that is being excreted. Um, if you look at the, on the left-hand side there, it almost looks like rain coming down, and then the little guy here in the middle is shooting out that honeydew. So you can imagine, we mentioned that folks didn't want to walk in the woods. You can imagine if you're walking in the woods and you have hundreds of these above you in the tree canopy and they're all, exuding honeydew, um, you're basically being covered with sticky insect poop, which I don't know anybody who enjoys that. So we have the honeydew production and then sooty mold that acts as a substrate for sooty mold to come in. So you have sticky leaves that then turn black. It disrupts the photosynthesis. We also here on the right hand side, you can see the spotted lantern fly feeding on the tree trunk and we start to get fungal mats and streaming from, those are from the wounds that are made during feeding, the sap is coming out and the fungus grows on that. So just to give you an idea, um, impacts on grape production and that's what uh, most of the work right now has been done on. Um, it's still brand new. Like I said, the information that we're getting is the information that folks in Pennsylvania are doing and Virginia and New Jersey, and we're getting the information from them. So just, you know, you can kind of take this and translate it into your crop, um, if you would. So the impacts on grape production, um, insecticides needed. They went from applying three to five insecticides to almost 15 insecticides in the premium wine grape industry. Um, it reduced the yield, it reduced winter hardiness because it's pulling the carbohydrates out there, out of the vine when it pulls the sap out. Um, so you have dieback, reduced fruit quality, even though they don't feed on the fruit. They have honeydew that's produced, it hits the fruit. You get sooty mold, it's very difficult to sell that way. Um, annoying to pickers, they are really um, clumsy landers, so they'll be cruising along and they just smack into you. And the honeydew attracts stinging insects. Right now, not sure the effect on wine quality. Don't know what the long-term effects are. And 
effects on pollinators. The pollinators are coming in and they're actually collecting the sugar from um, when the spotted lanternfly leaves and the sap is being exuded, they'll come and collect that rather than um, go and visit the pollen. And also when they're doing some of the control methods with the insecticides, whether it's tree injections or sprays on the grapes, um, that also has an effect on the pollinators. And it can impact the quality of life. Here on the left-hand side, you can see some steps. And this um, had a pretty heavy infestation of spotted lanternfly adults up in the tree. And you can see that the honeydew rained down, the sooty mold grew, and the bottom steps there, they used a power washer to power wash off. And then they took this photo to show the difference of what it was before and after. And you can see even with the power washer, they didn't get all the sooty mold off of there. Here on the right hand side is a black cherry tree and that is covered with spotted lanternfly adults and you can see more of them crawling over to join the group. So impacts on forests and natural areas. Um, and I wanna thank Sarah Wurzbacher, who is the forestry extension educator with Penn State Extension of Lycoming County. Um, like she said, right now they're still trying to learn a lot about it, but here's some things that she um, provided that they're starting to see. The, again, honeydew and sooty mold deposition is a problem. It can decrease the diversity of species, both plants and the wildlife, um, especially on the understories. The honeydew and sooty mold just adds an additional stress to the complex of stresses, along with the feeding of spotted lanternfly um, on the trees. So, you know, what killed the tree was the spotted lanternfly, just the last straw on the camel's back. And they decrease the ability for forests to regenerate. Um, young trees are less able to withstand stress and through feeding and honeydew and sooty mold production, um, that's just a stress they may not be able to handle. And in Pennsylvania, they have seen where the um, restrictions that are placed on when logging can occur is a problem. Um, and it also, they're seeing increased cost of compliance with the quarantine that's been put in place down in Pennsylvania. So talk a little bit about pathways and spread. Okay, it started in 2014. Um, they figured it was there probably in 2020, and it came over with a lotus stone from China, and it was able to build up its populations for two years. And somebody was walking through the woods and noticed a tree of heaven, and it had all these insects on it that they had never seen before. They happened to know a forester from the area. They called him, he came over, he actually identified the insect. He knew um, what group it belonged to. And so they positively identified it as spotted lanternfly, figured it had a two year head start. Um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA got together and they put a quarantine. Well, actually it's a state quarantine. So it's Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture put the quarantine in place in 2014. And you can see that it was just a few townships and then it grew to more townships in 2015, and then it grew from there in 2016. And this is with a lot of effort being put toward keeping um, containment of this pest. So this isn't where they just went out and did surveys and said they were in trying to remove tree of heaven. Um, they were putting insecticide sprays on, they were doing some banding, different things. But you can see that it just kept growing and growing. And this is one of the reasons why we're so concerned is that even with a concerted effort, you can see that it just keeps moving. So as of the end of last month, 2019, September 30th, 2019, you can see here are in the blue, that is the New York State external quarantine, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, the red lines that are around the counties indicate that those counties are part of an internal state quarantine. So you can see that all the counties in Pennsylvania and New Jersey that have infestations of spotted lanternfly, both those states have put internal quarantines on. Virginia, 
um, just did the internal state quarantine. They had an infestation there for a while um, that was just part of the New York quarantine. And you can see Maryland is actually, um, it has an infestation, but they're still working on uh, state quarantine, but it does fall into the New York state quarantine. And then Newcastle County, Delaware, they have the northern part of that county, Delaware, has quarantined the northern part, but New York State, with their quarantine, they only quarantine full counties. So that's why you see the entire county blue. And then the interesting thing is if you look at the yellowish tan there, that indicates counties where spotted lanternfly has been found, but surveys have indicated that it was a hitchhiker or hitchhikers that came up. Um, they were dead and they were not part of an infestation. And I mentioned that map. Um, this is actually a map from the October 2019 Journal of Economic Entomology. Um, the authors Wacky, Nevin, Yi, and Lu. They had ran the models to determine where um, spotted lanternfly might end up or have the best possibility of ending up. And so you can see the red areas are the highest. So you have Southeast PA, um, the area where it really is getting going now, um, the Hudson Valley, Long Island, um, into Connecticut, and then over into the Midwest and also California and Idaho. So movement of spotted lanternfly um, have reports that the population can move by itself three to four miles a year. Um, and they do that by hopping. They're very good plant hoppers. They're very good hoppers or by flying. Um, the adults here in the United States have exhibited a characteristic that has not been seen in their native range where they'll get to the top of a tree and then they catch thermals and fly up into the thermal and then get carried away. But most of the movement is due to them being excellent hitchhikers. And so it's basically human activity that's moving them. The adults and egg masses are the most common life stage to hitchhike. Um, the adults like to fly into anything. If you go down to the quarantine zone, keep your windows rolled up. If you're unloading something from a truck, unload it, close the back of the truck. Um, when you're loading, you know, don't leave it open for long periods of time because they will fly in. So as I mentioned, the typically moved by human activity. So you wanna check anything if you're going into the quarantine zone, you wanna look for all the different life stages and knowing what the life stage is or the life cycle, knowing when the different life stages are available, that'll let you know what type of um, spotted lanternfly or what life stage you should be looking for. And we also have a spotted lanternfly checklist that if you're going into the quarantine zone, um, you can use that to give you an idea of what you should be looking for and what you should be examining before you leave the quarantine zone. So here is a, just a short video of spotted lanternfly adults flying from a wooded edge a half mile away into a vineyard. And it almost looks like flocks of birds coming in. And talking to the grape growers down there is that they would go in and they would spray, they would get control, and then the next thing you know, more of them would be flying in. So they're, you know, they say that they're clumsy flyers. They're, when I see them, they don't necessarily look like clumsy flyers. They're very large. Um, they are very clumsy at landing though. So when we talk about movement, um, one of the things that we can look at and we say that, you know, the adults are one of the stages that are really good at the movement part of it. And if you look at the Pennsylvania Spotted Lanternfly Call Center and website, um, they get a spike in the middle of June They'll to over 2,000 calls a week and 60,000 website visits for their spotted lanternfly. So this is basically from people who um, aren't aware of spotted lanternfly or it's not been there before. And they're saying, hey, I'm seeing spotted lanternfly coming in what should I do about it? And you can see here, even though we mentioned that um, the adults and the egg masses are the ones that the life stages that are most typical hitchhikers, you can see here the fourth instar larva. Um, this machine was parked 
and they were getting ready. It was on a trailer. They were getting ready to um, move it out, and you can see that spotted lanternfly, the fourth end stars, climbed all over the tire. So before they were able to move this, they had to go in and make sure that all the larva or nymphs were removed. So we mentioned they're excellent hitchhikers. And so the concern is, you know, here's the blue down here of the quarantine area. And you can see that the red is the major railroad systems, the blue is the major highways. And you can see that they correspond in New York, they correspond to where we're finding um, spotted lanternfly. So I mentioned in Southeast PA, um, spotted lanternfly is everywhere. You can see the truck going down the road and it is going underneath a tree of heaven that's overhanging the road. So it isn't hard to believe that uh, adults would just plop down onto the top of that and you think they um, have little um, hooks on their feet and so they don't bite you, but you can definitely tell when they're crawling on your bare skin, kind of like a Japanese beetle. Um, and one of the workers down there was saying that they checked out their vehicle, they got in, they're driving along, and they look out, they're driving 65 miles an hour back to State College, and they see a spotted lanternfly adult that is hanging on for dear life um, onto the windshield wiper of their vehicle. And so they had to stop and kill it and on their way, but um, just gives you pause to think that at 65 miles an hour, these critters are able to hang on. So here um, is another, you know, railroads are the big thing. And I don't think we need the sound, but you can see that we have a spotted lanternfly adult that is on the tree of heaven and it's right by a railroad and you can see how slowly that is moving. A lot of times the trains will stop on the tracks and for whatever reason, the spotted lanternfly seem to like rusty metal to lay, lay, to lay their eggs on. They'll lay their eggs on everything or anything. Um, they used to say smooth surfaces, smooth hard surfaces, but they've found it on um, rusty 55 gallon drums, rusty box cars. They've even found it on the cushions of patio furniture, so the soft cotton um, out there. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's between the railroads, the trucks, and the ports. And they did find in Manhattan they found a barge sitting off, getting ready to unload that had come from the port of Philadelphia and it had spotted lanternfly on it. So we can get attacked any number of ways um, coming from the quarantine zone. So talk a little bit about monitoring and management. So monitoring currently, you know, you saw the map, you saw where the infestations were. Um, currently there's no infestations in New York state and most of the Northeast um, once you get past New Jersey, we're pretty um, clean. So knowing how to properly identify and report all the life stages and monitoring for the pests are the most important management strategies that we have at this time. Um, monitor vehicles and shipments from quarantine areas for all life stages of the pest. You know, supposedly the folks that are shipping stuff up to you are supposed to be checking for spotted lanternfly before they leave, but my recommendation has been that if you know that what you're purchasing is coming up from the quarantine zone, make sure that you check it out for all the different life stages um, once you receive that. And identify tree of heaven in the area to use in monitoring. As I mentioned before, um, in Pennsylvania, they were actually going in and they were removing tree of heaven. Um, to try and remove the food source. We're not at that point right now in New York State. In fact, you can actually make things worse if you don't try and, re, um, or if you don't remove tree of heaven properly, you can actually take a large tree and turn it into a grove because you'll get more tree of heaven popping up from the root uh, mass that was left behind. So here's the banding 
that they're doing down in Pennsylvania. This is an open ban. They're looking at different methods that um, make it more difficult for birds and bats and things like that to get in there because they're finding secondary catches of those. Um, they see a free meal, they come down and they get stuck as well. Um, this shows the adult stage and really even though there's a lot stuck on there, the adults they've found are strong enough that they can actually walk over the some of the sticky bands that are there. The sticky bands tend to work better for the first through the third instars. Once you start getting to adults or the fourth instar and the adults, they're not as effective. But you can see here the little the black instars. So you probably they're big enough. They're probably getting into the second third in star stage and one volunteer in southeast pa they banded 44 trees and killed um, over 64,000 spotted lanternfly so in and of itself they haven't found that banding will eliminate the population but you can keep it down to a dull roar um, especially if it's just getting started in your area so symptoms of spotted lanternfly feeding you have yellowing of the leaves flagging of the shoots um, the honeydew, the sooty mold, and the sap streaks. But you do want to go in and keep going and do a little more investigation because there are other things that produce flagging, um, yellowing, other, you know, aphids produce honeydew, and then the sooty mold. So just because you have these doesn't mean you have spotted lanternfly. You need to take that next step and find um, one of the life stages that's doing that. And it's interesting, they talk about pines or conifers and spotted lanternfly, but they don't seem to feed on the conifers, but they will lay their eggs on the trunks and limbs when the trees are, especially when they're near areas of heavy infestations. And so for like the Christmas tree growers, um, you'll want to look around your plantation to make sure that spotted lanternfly isn't building up on the outside because they will move in and they'll lay their eggs. Um, and then you have an egg mass and you can see here the middle branch there that what looks like the long splotch of mud is actually a very large egg mass that has been laid on that branch of the Christmas tree. And make sure you correctly identify um, the pests. So some of the insects that we've seen that people have reported that resemble lanternfly, the black-legged tick in the bottom right-hand corner, and then green stink bug nymphs. So make sure you have correct identification. So the great thing about the incident command system is that there is a single way to report spotted lanternfly. Um, if you see spotted lanternfly, take a photo of it. Um, if you can kill it and you can put a dime or a ruler or just something so it gives an idea of size, take the photo and then send that photo to spottedlanternfly at dec.newyork.gov. And when you do that, you want to provide the location. If you're in town and you have a street address and zip code, that's great, intersecting streets. Um, if you're out and about, you know, in the woods and that, if there's a landmark or a GPS coordinate that you can um, provide, that would be great. And then remove and kill any spotted lanternfly stages. Um, you can do this by placing it in a vial or bag of alcohol, or if you have sand, hand sanitizer, which lots of folks do, go ahead and put it in the hand sanitizer. There's enough alcohol there to kill it. And then you can place it in the freezer or just put it in the freezer and it'll kill it. You do wanna keep the sample of the insect that you found because when you report this, you will be contacted and they will want to come and do a positive identification. If they do positively identify it as spotted lanternfly, then they come out and they do grid searches around the location where it was found to make sure that it is not part of a population that um, is infesting the area that, and what they found so far is that when they go out and they check, they do the grid searches or surveys, um, they found that they're all hitchhikers in New York State. So let's talk about quarantines a little bit, and this is where I'm really not an expert, but Ethan Angel from 
um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets provided us with this information. So quarantine basically is when an actionable pest is identified by quarantine authority. And in this case, um, for New York, it's Department of Ag and Markets and regulate articles that may facilitate the further movement and distribution of the pest outside the regulated area. And some folks are saying, oh, why do you have quarantines? Obviously they don't work. They're not keeping it contained, it's still spreading. But the quarantine is a way to minimize, help to minimize the spread, um, to educate folks. And we're, you know, there's, really no thought that it will, a quarantine will eliminate the possibility of us getting spotted lanternfly. I think it's more of a um, when, not if we get spotted lanternfly um, in our areas, but this will at least to hope it down. And the purpose is to prevent restrictions on host commodities and non-host commodities that might otherwise come under regulation and to maintain the smallest regulated area possible. Okay, so that's legalese for we want to limit the area that this has gone into. And um, if we look at the um, regulation here, this is the quarantine area for the New York State external quarantine. And you can see, um, if you think, here's all the different counties. It's um, Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, Delaware, and then in Maryland, it's under the New York State external quarantine. As I mentioned, all of these, with the exception of Maryland, have internal state quarantines as well. So here's that map again. And so that gives you an idea the blue is the quarantine that we have to worry about. So regulated articles. Um, basically, you cannot take any living stage of spotted lanternfly out. Um, landscaping, remodeling, brush debris, yard waste, logs, tree parts, firewood, packing material, plants and plant parts. That's one of the ways that we're really seeing spotted lanternfly coming up is to the nurseries. They'll buy plants from down within the quarantine zone and they come up and even though the nurseries have tried really hard to limit the amount of spotted lanternfly, um, we're still seeing where um, for the most part, they're dead, but some live ones that maybe aren't 100%, they're feeling the effects of the insecticide, but they still make it up. So as I said, if you purchase anything from down there, if you bring anything up from down there, if you have friends visiting from down in the quarantine zone, um, check out their car before um, you let them in the house, I guess. So, and then outdoor household articles, as I mentioned, they will lay their eggs on everything. So you wanna make sure that you're checking that out. And as uh, we saw in the previous photo, they will congregate on a tire of a vehicle. So you basically have to look at everything that you're bringing up. And that is the last one there. Any other article, commodity item, or product that has, or that is reasonably believed to be infested with or harboring, harboring spotted lanternfly. So here's an old tire that was sitting out and it was underneath a tree that had spotted lanternfly and you can see that there's seven different egg masses that are on that old tire. So if you grab that and you were cleaning up and you were hauling it out, um, what you'd wanna do is take uh, something stiff, a credit card, something like that, a scraper card, scrape that those egg masses into some alcohol or hand sanitizer to kill them and then you can remove the tire. So restrictions on movement of regulated articles uh, originating from or moved through a quarantine area into the state of New York. And you can see, you know, certificate of inspection um, accompanied by a way bill. And such regulated article has moved directly through a quarantine area without stopping. So if you've cruised through, let's say you go down um, to visit somebody in New Jersey, and you go through the quarantine zones and you drive through the quarantine zones and you don't stop with the exception of getting gas, then you don't have to worry about anything. But if you're a business and you're going down there and you stop for any other reason than getting gas or um, to, well, if you have mechanical problems. So getting gas or you have mechanical problems, if you stop for any other reason, um, you need to get a permit. 
So the permit's required to visit a quarantine zone. Now, New York State does not have its own permitting process, but it recognizes permits from Pennsylvania. So if you do any business down in um, the quarantine zone, your business is going to need a permit. Now, only one person in your business needs to have that permit, and then they become the trainer for the rest of your employees. So spotted lantern flag, you can get that permit online. And you basically, if you, you can use this link or you just Google spotted lantern flag permit Penn State University, and you'll go there. Um, it'll tell you that it's free of charge. Um, and it'll tell you that it takes two hours to accomplish. It doesn't, um, I did it, I had to do it because I was going down on different research trips. And so I became the trainer for the IPM program and you get your permit and it was just listening to folks basically speak on the video you took a couple short answered a few short questions at the end of each video and it was relatively easy to do and as i said you do the training online so once you do that and you complete your training you're going to get a permit that you keep with you. And if you're a business, you just ask for the number of permits that you need per vehicle. So each vehicle that is gonna go down into the um, quarantine area and stay there for any length of time is gonna need a permit. And you'll also get the spotted lantern fly, um, the quarantine checklist, which you can see, um, this is for Pennsylvania going in there. And then also the certificate of inspection that you fill out and you do both of these, you have your permit, you fill these out, and it shows that you're in compliance with the uh, quarantine. And if you have questions on complying with spotted lanternfly quarantine, um, this is for the Pennsylvania side. They have, Penn State has some great information online, and again, you can just Google that. Um, if you Google Penn State um, spotted lanternfly, you'll get also links to all sorts of information. So management, looking ahead. And really for management, like I said, we don't have any infestations right now, which is the good news. Um, so, but the other side of it is because we don't have the infestations, we can't do the work to um, come up with some of the management tools such as insecticides that can be used against spotted lanternfly. Um, in New York state, you have to have both the target pest and the crop or commodity or area that you're going to be applying this to. And so since we don't have that, we're working with the folks down at um, Penn State and Virginia and New Jersey to, they're allowing us to use their efficacy data for the insecticide trials that they do. And we're putting in FIFRA 2 E recommendations. And basically what that does is for materials that are insecticides that are already labeled for a particular commodity, um, we can add spotted lanternfly to that label. So we have a FIFRA 2 E recommendation um, that you have to print out and you carry that along with the original label when you make insecticide application. So like I said, we're working at developing these. We don't need them right now, but we hope to have a majority of the commodities covered. Um, anything that they're doing down in the quarantine zones that they're able to provide us the information um, we're not then going ahead and trying to get the two double E's. We have come up with a database of insecticides labeled for plant hoppers, but there really aren't very many of those. Um, we're looking, we, um, the Royal We, this is the folks at Penn State USDA are looking at biological controls and we have one of the um, Ann Hayek's lab here at Cornell is looking at some of the biological controls. And as I mentioned, we rely on the insecticide trials conducted at the quarantine zones for the efficacy data. So frequently asked questions we get is, um, one is, is spotted lanternfly a vector for viruses? And the answer to that is no, we haven't been able to find any viruses that are vectored by this pest. So that's good news. And are there biological control agents available? And there are, um, there's some of the major types of predators. Praying mantis will eat them, spiders will eat them. You can see here a stink bug eating them, but nothing 
of any major consequence, not enough to get um, control of a population once it reaches any sort of size. And so, as I mentioned, chickens don't eat them. Birds, if they do eat them, they will throw up and then they don't eat spotted lanternfly again. But you can see here that we do have some um, fungal pathogens that have been found. They, the USDA is over in um, China looking for parasitoids. They're looking for parasitoids in Southeast PA as well. So you have this tiny little moth that'll go in and lay its eggs inside the egg of a spotted lanternfly. It feeds inside that egg and instead of a spotted lanternfly emerging, um, another moth will. So this is the gypsy moth parasitoid and it was introduced in 1908. It helped to bring down populations of gypsy moth. It is not reported on spotted lanternfly in China and it's not really great at parasitism. Um, only about 7% parasitism of available egg masses and about 20% of the egg mass was parasitized. So you get some there and it was only found in some locations. So one of the things that they're looking at is can they ramp this up and get it into more locations and maybe increase the parasitism rates. So they're going, as I mentioned, they're going over to China. They did found, find an egg parasitoid right now, and the A. orientalis is widely distributed throughout China, and its parasitism raised, uh, ranged up to 92% of the egg masses, which is encouraging, um, and anywhere from 20 or 0 to 26% of the total egg mass or eggs in that egg mass were and so they have that over here now. It's in quarantine at APHIS. Um, the one thing we don't want to do is bring um, a biological control agent over here and find out that it causes more damage than it fixes. We don't want it over here if it also is going to attack, let's say, um, monarch butterfly eggs. So right now it's in quarantine, and that's typically a three to six year process. And then this one I think is pretty cool. It attacks the second and third end stars. So it will lay its egg. It develops inside the second and third end star nymph. It makes a protective sac in the nymph. It overwinters in a cocoon and um, you get 40% parasitism is what they've found over in China. And again, it was collected in June, 2018 and it's at an ARS quarantine lab. And then fungal pathogens. So um, research done by Eric Clifton, who is the postdoc with Dr. Ann Hayek's lab at Cornell University. They've been down in Southeast PA collecting um, fungal pathogens. They noticed that the, um, there were a number of, especially the adult spotted lanternfly that were covered with the white fluffy stuff. And they found two different um, species, Beruvia and Bacoa, major and they both attack have the ability to attack spotted lanternfly and kill it as a fungus so between what we're hoping is is that if we can keep spotted lanternfly out of new york state um, and actually try and keep it in the quarantine zone so it doesn't go out to other areas if we can keep that down then we'll have um, a suite of biological control agents that we can use against this pest um, because it doesn't seem from everything we've heard coming out of Southeast PA is that this pest is not one that you are gonna spray yourself out of. There's not enough um, insecticides and active ingredients to do that. So I just basically um, really quick want to cover spotted lanternfly resources from the New York State IPM program. Um, one of the roles that the IPM program has with the incident command system is to develop resources for others to use. And so you can visit us, um, tinyurl.com. You can actually do spotted lanternfly, Google spotted lanternfly New York State IPM program, and it would probably be easier. So just some of our resources, we have a website that contains all this stuff, the spotted lanternfly distribution map um, that I've shown you a couple different times today. We keep updating that. 
to try and keep it current. Um, pesticide quick guides, right now we have a grapes, hops, and tree fruit. We're working on an ornamentals, and as I said, as we get more um, information from down in the quarantine zone, we will increase it to other commodities. We did webinars um, that are actually on the Northeast IPM Center, and this one is being recorded today as well. We have four, um, or excuse me, spotted lantern fly slide sets. So if you um, have a meeting and you'd like to present something on spotted lantern fly, you can get in touch with us and we'd be more than happy to share those slide sets with you. A lot of video podcasts on the website. As I mentioned, the checklist for visiting the quarantine areas. We have the resources distribution list and then Moodle courses um, will be coming soon. So the take home messages, learn to identify all life stages of spot and lanternfly, inspect all the items coming out of the quarantine zone, and that's if you're purchasing something from the quarantine zone or if you've gone down to the quarantine zone and you're leaving. So if you're visiting a any of the quarantine zones, number one, get a permit, and then inspect your vehicle inside and out before departure. And if you see it, report it. If there's, you find it in New York State, and for those of you that aren't in New York State, um, you can actually Google reporting spotted lantern fly with your um, state name, and they will give you the appropriate agency to contact. And then again, for more information, search New York State IPM spotted lantern fly resources. And then if there's any questions, I'm gonna... Tim, great job. I'd, I'd like to thank you for scaring the daylights out of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not a bug we want to have in New York. So we no, appreciate I... all. This is just, I mean, it's just, and I'd seen this versions of this presentation I saw at the August training and it's still, it still is pretty scary. Um, so we do have, there have been several questions that have been posted and I can scroll back through and start reading those to you if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, and cool. there's, uh, so if, if people have questions, uh, this is the time to type them into the chat window, please send it to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see the question. So scrolling back. Um, so the first question from Mike uh, wants to know, so you mentioned the impacts to the lumber industry and Christmas trees. Is that, is that mostly because of their potential to be transported as part of those industries? So what's, yes. what's, the, what's the impact? So it's, it's that a, actually, yeah, that's a great question. And that from what we know to this point, that is the impact. So like, um, I think Sarah provided the information that, you know, there are just different times that they're able to cut trees. Uh -huh. and move trees and I think there was some you know if you're going to strip the bark you can't do that in the areas that some of the guys were finding down in southeast PA they weren't able to do it where they usually did it they actually had to go to a quarantine area and have it done there so it just add, added the cost mm -hmm. and I think what we saw last year um, especially with the Christmas tree growers is that all it takes is one person saying, oh, I found a spotted lanternfly, and all of a sudden the media jumps on that, and um, they were having difficulties, um, especially down in New Jersey, I think was where it was worse, but um, mm. they were having difficulties convincing people that um, they weren't giving them spotted lanternfly with their Christmas trees. Yeah, so if you had, this isn't part of the question, I'm just kind of <laughs> playing all along with this, um, so one thing I saw, you showed the picture of the spotted land, lanternfly adults um, on a on a mature black cherry. Right. So that's, I mean, that, you know, black cherry in Pennsylvania is big business in the western part of New York and central New York. There's a lot of uh, value in black cherry timber. So that's, I mean, that's not, that would not be a good thing. And I'm wondering about if you had, if you had it on a Christmas tree and you brought it inside for a few weeks, would that be sufficient warming to trigger a release of spotted lantern fly inside? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to, um, I had that on my notes that I wanted to mention, but they did find that, um, 
and it was in the New Jersey, where they brought it inside, they had an egg mass, and the eggs at room temperature, they hatched um, in 39 days. Wow. And, but the egg hatch was relatively low. There was only 10% egg hatch, but, you know, depending on how many egg masses you have, when you have 30 to 60 eggs in an egg mass, mm -hmm. um, and that's where they thought, they actually thought they had ticks in mm -hmm. their house rather than, because, you know, that I think was the, the old story was that if you bought Christmas trees, you were bringing ticks in your house. So, oh, okay. Yeah. It's, <laughs> poor Christmas tree guys. I feel for them. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, David asked a question, um, is there a good way to distinguish the spotted lanternfly egg masses from gypsy moth egg masses? Yeah, the gypsy moth egg mass tends to be um, a little fluffier, and the um, egg mass for the um, spotted lanternfly, especially early on, is almost putty-like and smooth and then it starts to crack as it goes through. But I think it's the, um, the gypsy moth is a little bit fluffier or hairier um, mm -hmm. than the spotted lanternfly. Okay. And then uh, Kelsey asked about the citation. You showed the picture of the potential distribution of spotted lanternfly. I found a link to that, just if people wanna look in the chat window. Um, okay. In Good. entomology today. So that's, that's yep. posted in there. Uh, Garrett wants to know for what time period the egg masses change color. It actually is pretty quick. So they'll be white for a few days and then they're a pinkish for, um, you know, a couple weeks and that, and then they start to get into the um, tannish. And then as it gets colder, they crack. Um, Mike asks, and Mike's from Minnesota, how cold hardy, and I guess a lot of New York would also have that same question. Do we know how cold hardy the spotted lantern flies are? Yeah, that's, I think um, if you look at the, or think about that map, it's like when you get into the Adirondacks in Northeast New York, then you start to get too cold for them. But they are actually pretty hardy insects um, they will make it to you'll survive below zero temperatures okay um, Danielle wants to know if this is something that can be reported on IMAP invasives are you familiar with that I am and you can report it on IMAP invasives um, but I would um, and where's Danielle from is because if you're uh, from New sure. York Okay, Danielle, if you're from New York, um, if you do IMAP invasives, um, make sure that you send it to spotted lanternfly at dec.newyork.gov because that will get a much quicker response. But you can do both. And you can do, um, I believe you can actually report Tree of Heaven through IMAP invasives as well. Okay. We had uh questions that you already covered about biological control and killing egg masses. Yeah, um, and okay, so the egg masses, they do have some insecticides that they've been looking at. Um, they've looked at, well, chlorophos, which we're getting rid of in a majority of states. That is one that um, seems to be effective against egg masses. Um, but they've looked at things like smothering agents, like um, stylet oil and that, and they get some efficacy from the egg from doing that. But right now, the best way to get rid of them is still to scrape them and put them into alcohol. Okay. Um, so is, and I'm asking this partly for my own benefit, I'm going to be making a trip down into Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in a couple of weeks is so if people are, are non-business travel, I'm, I mean, it's still a good idea, but is there, is it, is it um, expected that, that casual or recreational travelers go through the permitting process and training? Excellent question. You don't need to go through the permitting process, but you are um, required to comply with the um, 
New York State external quarantine. Okay. So when you go down there, you're, you know, the, really the requirement is that you check your vehicle over. Anything you bring back, you check, check mm -hmm. yourselves. It's interesting. And I say check yourselves because if you travel with somebody, it's really good to have them spin around and mm -hmm. make sure that they're not hanging on because um, I was down there with one of the folks from Pennsylvania Extension. And before we got back into the vehicle, it was like, okay, we checked each other out and I had three of them on my back. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right how effective are car washes like that's one of the yeah one of the things that they're looking at um because we're trying to um determine i think that it'll knock them off the top part but is it getting anything that's on the undercarriage yeah that would be the right and that's the hardest place to check also it's like you know correct unless you get mirrors or go on a car lift or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you know that, and that goes back to the quarantine. You can do the best you can and something, chances are something's going to slip through. Sure. Um, so I scrolled past. So is there any more recent word about how critical Alanthus is to the life stage development of spotted lantern fly. So there's, this is Paul Hetzler, who's now up in Ontario, and he's wondering, you know, if there's not much Alanthus around, is it is that gonna reduce the likelihood that, that the spotted lantern fly is gonna be successful in establishing? Right, and that's a great question, and the folks at USDA are looking at that. One of the problems that they're running into is that even though this insect pest is extremely prolific, um, it's tough to keep going because it because it's a phloem feeder. Um, it doesn't have a strong sucking um, mouth part, so it just has a big hollow space at the end of that tube. And so what they're finding is it's kind of like it likes plants where it can plug in and like plug it into a fire hose where they hit it and the turgor pressure just forces the sap into mm -hmm. them and so they've been doing the work and they do potted plant studies where they've put in um, they've looked at grape black walnut um, cherry tree of heaven and what they found is that they can get them to go through um, for a number of different species they've been able to get them to go from egg to adult but they never seem to make it any further, even with the tree of heaven. Hmm. And so um, they're trying to figure out a way to raise them in captivity to allow them to do those types of studies. Because the researchers, there's two different camps. One that says you have to have tree of heaven and the other that says that um, they, are, they would adapt if they didn't have the tree of heaven. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's, uh, somebody's noting that they had heard an anecdotal report from Monroe County that there were scores of adults that were collected. I'm not sure if that was in one location or multiple. And the, and the worry is that maybe some of these were gravid females and if they could have laid eggs before they were found. So is there any, like, do gravid females travel and how easily do they lay eggs or what's the, what's kind of the risk associated? And that's what the, the map that I had not seen before was all of those counties where they had found spotted lantern fly. Right. It's pretty scary. Yeah. So the, um, in Monroe County, I believe where they found the most, um, adults, they did find a good chunk of adults and those were at a Christmas tree operation and they were found at the base of the shaker machine that I guess they use the shaker to remove the loose needles and mm. it um, had the adults. All the adults were dead, but gravid females do travel. Um, so we you just need to be cautious. They don't fly as well once they, especially when they um, become fully engorged with eggs. Um, they're pretty clumsy, so they don't fly as well. But um, yes, they will come up and um, they can be a real problem. But I think in Monroe County, 
the ones that they found so far have all been um, dead. And, you know, I don't know if they um, found, well, I know that they didn't find any egg laying on the Christmas trees that they um, had inspected. Okay. Um, Colin wants to know if there's a time of year that the inspections are more important than other years. For example, egg masses versus instars versus adults. Yeah, so I'm going to go with my experience in grapes. And so they're looking at it and they're saying we can put up with the feeding from the nymphs because it really doesn't seem to affect the vine that much. But then they concentrate once the adults start to come in, that's when they concentrate their spraying. And so it's twofold. They want to keep the populations down because they're getting into harvest. And that's when also they want the carbohydrates to go into the fruit and the root system to carry them through the, the vines through the winter rather than through the spotted lanternfly. Um, and also they want to try and control as many as adults as they can so they don't lay eggs because mm -hmm. each female um, has the ability to lay two egg masses. So you're looking anywhere between those two egg masses, 60 to 120 eggs. So if you can limit the egg laying, that's going to limit the population that you have going mm -hmm. into next year. Sure. So I'm, so that so that's the inspections on the plants i'm wondering it's not clear i'm wondering if colin was thinking about the kind of the travel inspections uh, associated okay. with travel yep so is there is it uh, when is and, and i guess i mean it's obviously and he's not suggesting otherwise so it's they're always important is there maybe a time when they're most easily missed or most likely to be attached to vehicles that are moving around or how okay. is there any way to think about that? Yep, I think the egg masses are probably um, the life stage that's gonna be most easily missed. And it's also around the longest, because if you think they start laying eggs in August, mm -hmm. um, and then they're there until the next spring. And what they've found is that they do like to lay their eggs on the undersides of things. So if you have pallets, sitting out what they found is that they'll crawl in between and underneath where the forks would go and they'll lay their eggs on the underside of that wood yeah, and so i would say egg masses you know if you can um, learn to identify egg masses then you're going to be a long way into um, taking care of this okay and then there's a, a note from Christine to you and I. She's with New York State DOT. And I'm going to connect you two by email after this. She's interested in the slides for Great. training uh, construction inspectors. All right. Yep. Okay. I'm actually putting together a narrated version um, or typing up the comments. So I can definitely get that to her so they have that part of it as well. Okay. And this will, I'll have this presentation, we'll down, I'll uh, convert the recording and have it posted on YouTube tomorrow morning. So, All right. um, Amanda wants to know if where on the tree the egg masses are laid, are they at the base or in the canopy or any, any particular location on the tree? Yeah, that's, um, they did, I'm trying to remember, Penn State did a study and they were trying to determine that very thing. And so they sent folks out with binoculars to count egg masses and see where they were. And they're easier to find, obviously, on the lower half. But what they found is they cut a few of the trees down to actually do the counts. And they found that they were distributed throughout the tree. Mm. And um, so it isn't, you can't just look at one section of a tree to find them unfortunately <laughs> that'll make it easy do they no they do not uh, all right um so the next two questions we've talked about uh, let's see is there and i've i've heard about this and 
uh, I think maybe you had talked about it some in the August session. This question's about whether you can use systemic, um, they say herbicides, I'm wondering, insecticides, insecticides on the tree of heaven. You, know, you essentially create a trap tree approach. And yes. uh, so is that is that found success in Pennsylvania? Is that under consideration in New York or other places? Yep, they're still trying to figure out um, in Pennsylvania the um, how useful that is, what they found. So what they do, because you have male and female tree of heaven, is that they'll go in and they remove all the female trees because that way you don't have the Samara to go around and make new trees. So they'll cut those down. They actually use a systemic herbicide when they cut those trees down to make sure that um, the tree of heaven doesn't sprout up from the roots. So they're taking care of that. They'll leave a few male trap trees and they inject those with systemic insecticides. And then when they come to feed the um, spotted lanternfly um, are killed. And so what they're finding, and as I mentioned, they tend to come back to the same trees. And when you then make just trap trees, they're finding that it does work. It brings them in, it kills them. But even though they're dying from feeding on the insecticide, the swarm feeding um, is enough that they're starting to see where the tree of heaven that are being used as trap trees are starting to decline as well. <laughs> wow. And so they're moving, yeah, they're moving <laughs> off into other species. So, and right now, like I said, in New York state and the other states, because we don't have the populations here yet, there's no infestations, we're really into the monitoring and just using the tree of heaven. You know, the more tree of heaven you have, the more you, um, potential you have for them to show up on it. So we're using more as a monitoring tool. If I was gonna do anything with tree of heaven, it would be to put the banding on them. And so you'll have that opportunity to catch the nymphs. They, for whatever reason, the nymphs enjoy going up and down the trunks of the tree. Hmm. And so that would be a good management or monitoring tool. Is there a protocol for the banding on the IPM website? Um, nope, but we can put one up there. Okay. And that, that gets to a question that I'm looking at here in just a minute that might be helpful. Uh, the next one though from Nancy wants to know, uh, as, as this bug spreads southward, if they're likely to have multiple generations in one year. Yeah, and that's where if you go and look at that um, journal article that you um, found the citation for, mm -hmm. they seem to think that once it gets to the more southern areas, the temperatures will actually make it unsuitable for them. So they're not thinking that there'll be two generations a year, but they're thinking that they're just won't, they won't do well hmm. down there. So they'd be limited by heat. Right. Well, yep. that's different. Okay. Uh, Shannon wants to know what county government or and or municipal officials can do to address this threat and you know especially preventing the spread and the introduction um, if there's any good proactive policy examples that have been worked with um, I don't know if there's any policy examples but I know that some of the um, counties have worked with their local prisms. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be, I think, a good way to connect and get the word out locally. But I will, I will check into that, Shannon. Um, and you can tell you what, you can always email me. I don't know if I have, I don't think I gave you my email, but it's thw the numeral four at cornell.edu. And I'll All type right. it in too. I just typed it in. Oh, so. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I guess they can always, always a good starting point is with your local office of, of Cornell Cooperative Extension, or if you're in a different right. state, your, your Cooperative Extension office. 
Yes. So, all right. Uh, Lane is asking about a web link to the quarantine site map. I'm assuming the quarantine map is on the New York State IPM website. It is. No? Yep. Okay. If you go to the um, that so, website, it's down. You scroll down a little bit, and it's right there. Okay. Um, I'm just looking down through the. Uh, so any any information on the uh, reasons why birds don't like to eat these? Is there a toxic chemical or just the texture or something like that? Yeah, that's they're actually trying to pull that out um, because they figure there are um, they found different chemicals in Tree of Heaven that are just noxious types of chemicals. And they're trying to determine um, if any of those or their um, byproducts are absorbed by the spotted lanternfly. But you know, in nature, typically if you get the red or the orange coloration like monarch butterflies, um, birds know not to eat them because they um, don't taste good and mm -hmm. they're noxious so i think that's they are looking at that um to see just what it is that makes them so unpalatable mm -hmm. okay so that uh that concludes all the questions tim this was a, a great presentation this really a, i don't want i'll say it's a lot of fun but in a in a <laughs> in an informative sort of fun way not in a something to look forward to sort of fun way um, but this is so this has been recorded. Uh, yeah, we peaked out at 154 participants. So that, wow. was, that was really nice. And uh, Tim will be joining us again tonight at 7 p.m. So if, if, uh, if you want to see this all over again, you're welcome to, <laughs> to come back and join us. I will be here and Tim will be here. And, yep. and some you're gluttons for punishment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. Well, Tim, thank you very much.